We welcome all of you here tonight and those who have joined us by live stream. We consider your your fellowship in the truth very, uh, very precious. I'm sure that uh, many of you have heard this already, but there has been a an outcry of the apparently a large Christian constituency against Hobby Lobby for being hypocritical. And they brought this, they've brought the problem into the political arena. This is a terrible, terrible testimony. You will find in Scripture that no man or woman of God was ever drug into the political arena. And yet this is fashionable. And there are a lot of Christians that do this. They like to banter around about political issues. And uh, I was very disturbed that Christ Christians are getting credit for this type of thing. So this tells us that the judgment that was rendered overturned a lot of inimical powers more than people think. It was not coincidence that the judge changed his mind. Now this will be our 12th exposition of the book of Jude. We're going to be in verse 16 tonight. I wanted to say a few preliminary words. As you know, man is a, is a living creature and he was made to be a servant. <clears throat> primarily of God himself. But because God made him that way, he can be adversely effective or positively effective. See, if man wasn't made to be a servant, this could not be. This is what I want you to see. The fact that men can be pulled to the right or to the left is a testimony to you that they are, that man's been, it's not, some say, well, that's the testimony of man's free will. That's not, that's, that completely misses the point. The point is man was not made to be free. That's the point. And so in a moral arena, you've got far forces of darkness and power of light vying for the personality that is intended, divinely intended to be a servant. That's why we're dealing with these things. See, Satan actually knows more about men than a lot of Christian people. No, no man, for instance, can influence a rock or a cloud or a star because they weren't made like man was made, see. They're not personalities that can be influenced. Their behavior can't be modified by men, but because men are made to be servants, <laughs> their behavior can be modified by men secondarily and by God primarily. If a person is a believer, if a person who's a believer doesn't fall, it's more owing to God keeping him from falling than it is to his discipline. His discipline is involved, I understand. If a person, see they're kept by the power of God through faith, that's, that's the undergirding factor. But the, the, the God keeping people by the power of God through faith is contingent upon you being in the sphere where this happens. Amen. If you're in the flesh, that's, that's not where it happens. And if a person stands in the gale of a strong temptation and they stand, it's more owing to the fact that God made them stand, Amen. as Romans 14.4 states. 
It's this propensity of man to be unduly impressed that is occasion this writing of Jude. That's why he's writing this. This is the situation we're in. See, you can't think of people as stupid or brilliant or willing or not willing. You know, the, that those conditions exist, but those are those are not at the basic level. At the basic level is man is vulnerable. Even the first man. <laughs> when you're made to serve, that's it's not serve like robots serve. Anyway, it's important truth to truth to see. All of the things Jude is writing should have been detected by the people. It's shameful that they didn't. He's, he's describing some false teachers. They should have recognized them and not allowed them in. They were unduly impressed. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says, now some of you don't even know God. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Some of you don't know God. This is a church member. These are people in the church. This isn't people on the outside. Some of you don't know God. He says, I say this to your shame. Any church should be ashamed if members don't know God. Either that or you just take Roman, 1 Corinthians 8, I think it's 34, just take it out of the Bible. But it's shameful, shameful for people that are in Christ to not know God or to be unduly impressed by false teachers. This is shameful. It doesn't relieve the responsibility of the teachers, mind you. If it is true that we're complete in Christ, if that's not an overstatement, this is Colossians 2.10. You are complete in him. Now, if that's not an overstatement, there is no excuse for backsliding or growing cold or being deceived or falling away. There, if that statement is true, a case cannot, a defensive case cannot be made for somebody who's overcome by sin. It is impossible. Now, there's a way out. I'm not saying it's not a way out. I'm saying the church has got to stop this infernal explaining why people are sinning. We've had enough of it. We don't need any more of it. People need to grow up. God expects them to grow up. He'll protect them during the initial stage. Make no mistake about it. He'll protect them during the initial stage. But there comes a time. Well, the time came for these people and Jews writing to. What had happened was these people could not see clearly. They couldn't, as Peter said, see afar off. Well, they didn't recognize these false teachers. But they couldn't see afar off. They weren't walking in the light because Jesus said if a man walks in the light, he'll not stumble. John said the same thing. If a man walks in the light, he'll not stumble. All right, now that's the truth. Either that's the truth or it isn't. Amen. You walk in the light, you don't stumble. Isaiah said the highway of holiness was a highway. They that are on it will not err. That's what he said. Isaiah 35, 8. But see, I hear all the time people explaining why Christians err. I'm not saying they don't err. I'm saying there's a reason why they err, and it's not because there's some kind of deficiency in salvation or some kind of inadequacy in Jesus or the gospel isn't power enough. I'm saying they drifted out of the safety zone. Amen. And they did it while they were in Christ. This is amazing. But that's what happened here to the uh, people Jews read into so Jew's not dealing with something that should be tolerated. Amen. He's not offering it like a convenient explanation. This is how they're born. They had a lot of handicaps at home, or you know, all of the they got their genes or the DNA is messed up, or he's just dealing with it the way it is. Now he's talking about these teachers. Understand they didn't look like this. That's why he has to say this. 
These were wolves, sheep, wolves in sheep's clothing. They didn't look like this. But Jude saw them, and he, he, tells what it, what it, he tells what they are. This verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. <laughs> I, I am... Uh, I'm continually challenged by the fact that apostolic writers expected you to understand what they said. Yeah. Uh, aren't, you, aren't, you kind of, aren't you impressed with that? That today people don't understand and they, the way you hear church people talk that you're not expected to understand. But, yeah, right. but Jude, he's, <laughs> he doesn't like tone it right way down to the lower shift and say mom, mom, dad, dad. And stuff. He doesn't do that. He tells you something you've got to put your thinking cap on may have to pray about for understanding for this, but he just he just says these things and he you're expected to understand them. You read the epistles, some people are scared to death to read the epistles, you know. Don't understand. You're expected, these were written to people like us. These were written to like super Christians. <laughs> these, these were written to people just like us. And, we're, and you're, you're, God expects you to understand the Bible. He does, and he's made provision for you to do so if you lack wisdom, like ask. And he'll give you open, he'll give you, he'll enlighten your understanding. In fact, Paul prayed that he'd do this. So anyway, that, that's just a kind of a passing comment, but this text would require most people would have to have a lot of explanations about what this text said, but Jude just expects you to comprehend it. <laughs> Recent converts. Yes. Yeah, about three weeks. Yeah. Paul was there three three Sabbaths. Mm -hmm. Not even not even three like extended weeks. It was three Sabbaths. Yeah. Three <laughs> three times they were exposed to gospel preaching. Three times. Yeah. And they grabbed it up just like God had said it. So what about people who heard it 50 times hmm? or 100 times? How do you think they stack up next to this? What do you think the Thessalonians are going to do? If the Queen of Sheba is going to rise up on the Day of Judgment, say, look, I traveled from across the world to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and a greater than Solomon is here. What do you think the church at Thessalonica would say, look, we heard the gospel three times, three Sabbath days. We don't even know if it was all day. And we embraced it wholeheartedly. Yes, we were mistaken about some things, but what Paul told us what to do, we obey. We, we heard just like an angel speaking from heaven. That's how we regard it. What, what's, what are they going to say to the average United States Christian? Do you think that this won't, will not be brought up? Do you think on the day of judgment that this will not be brought up? That there are people that have been exposed, 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 and still haven't caught on? No, I want to get off of that. <laughs> off of that. These are murmurers. <clears throat> some of the other versions, this is what some of the other versions say. It tells you what kind of word this is. Grumblers. Men who make trouble, discontented grumblers. These people complain. They're constant gripers. It's the living Bible. <laughs> constant gripers. The word murmurs, as used here, means one who's discontented or complains against God. I think we've got to consider this word in view of the Israelites, who are kind of a classic example of murmuring. Remember, these are teachers. These are murmurers. They murmur. It's against God. The Israelites, remember, they came out of Egypt in one night, about three million of them, in sync. They had babies and kids and animals. Why, well, you, could, you couldn't empty Joplin in a week. 
they left that. See that? So that that was God says. <laughs> God brought them out. They crawled. All, all of them went through the Red Sea on dry ground. All of them did. All of them saw the Pharaoh and his armies drowned on the shore. All of them ate miraculous bread. All of them drank miraculous water. First Corinthians 10 itemizes that for you. They were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Cloud on top, sea beneath, see? All of them. But when they began, uh, they, when they got thirsty, Exodus 15, 24, right after they delivered, they murmured against Moses. When they began their trek to the desert, they murmured against Moses and Aaron, Exodus 16, 2. When they thirsted again for water, Exodus 17, 3, they murmured against Moses. When the spies gave an evil report of the promised land, remember that? The children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. When Korah and his rebels were slain by the Lord, remember that? The people murmured against Moses and against Aaron saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Well, I'll tell you. In his valedictory address, when he's saying goodbye, <laughs> Moses told the people, You murmured in your tents. Because the Lord said, and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. That's 40 years later, four decades later. Moses brings this up. You murmured in your tents. And the psalmist. Psalm 106, 25, he draws attention to it and said they murmured in their tents. I'm showing you what God thinks of murmuring. In the days of Joshua, all the congregation murmured against the princes. This is Joshua 9, 18. Remember Mary? That Mary, Jesus was in Bethany shortly before his betrayal. Poured a bottle of precious ointment on Jesus' head and some of his, the people murmured against her. The Pharisees murmured against the disciples, Luke 5.30. The Pharisees and scribes murmured against Jesus when the publicans and sinners came to him. Well, I know people today say he went to them, but the Bible says they came to him. It's important to know that distinction. It's a big difference between Jesus coming to you and you coming to Jesus. But when they saw the publicans and sinners came to him, they murmured. Mainly because they, they weren't doing it. When he went to the house of Zacchaeus, the people all murmured, the Bible says. <laughs> when Jesus said he was the bread that came down from heaven, the Jews murmured at him. There was much murmuring among the people about Jesus saying that he was deceiving the people. Yeah. John 7, 12. See, murmuring, this is... It's been in scripture. Throughout history, murmuring has existed among professed followers of Christ. Yes. Murmurs. Yes. I've noticed in the workplace that murmuring is like a virus. Oh, yeah. yes, it if is. If some one person yes. begins to talk about how this isn't right and that isn't right, and before you know it, it's spread throughout the whole room. But I've also noticed that the opposite can be true. If you start talking about the great things that God's yes. done, that can spread too. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we praise the Lord for it. <coughs> yeah, there's people, uh, <laughs> they're chronic murmurs. They're griping about the government. They're griping about Social Security. They're griping about taxes. They're griping about prices. And it's like a plague. That's right. Nobody has a right to murmur. Amen. God didn't promise you beds of ease. Yes. Yes, sister. Mm. I notice that if they gripe about uh, their workmates, they'll gripe about you. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. And it's a it's a frame of mind that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Oh and, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, what convicted me was Revelation when uh, 
It spoke of the devil as being the accuser of the brethren the and brother. the father of all liars. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it dawned on me he was the father of all accusers. Oh. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that initiates the accusing of the brethren. And they lay so and I, when I am accusing one of my brothers or sisters, I'm doing the devil's work. Yeah. Yeah. If I am confronting them in love, I'm not. Yeah. But if I am talking about them behind their back, I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's talking about false accusation, you know. It, Paul said to Timothy, he says, now, don't rebuke an elder, but if he sins, rebuke him before everybody. <laughs> so that's, Satan has no cause to accuse the saints. And if a person accuses God's people just because it's a pet peeve or a gripe or something like that, this is, this is serious. This is serious. And, and if they have someone who were once a sinner, like it, it's common for preachers to criticize Abraham and criticize Jacob, David. I hear it all the time. But those men are forgiven. And they weren't as bad as these people let on either. But they were forgiven. And if you're forgiven, you don't want people <laughs> hauling up your past, do you? Amen. Not that anyone here has done it, but nobody should haul up the past of somebody who is forgiven. Amen. That's a that's bad accusation. But these are these are murmurers. Murmurers, they forget that God's the governor among the nations. Ada? Yeah, yeah the, what you said there is you're complaining against God. And Jude has already covered things that he, he exposed about these false teachers, these false prophets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm reminded when Jesus was speaking to the people about eating his flesh and drinking yes. his blood, yes. and they murmured. Yes. And Jesus asked, does this offend you? Yeah. Yeah. And really murmuring comes from being, this kind of murmuring comes from being offended right. by something God has ordained, right. or something God has said, choosing a different way thinking another way to be better, and what comes from that? Murmuring, yeah. complaining. You know, you think that the early church, Nero, he was reigning. This is, this is who was reigning. This is who government they were under. Nero. Well, I could imagine. Well, I could only imagine. What today's Christians, boy, they'd be, <laughs> they'd be mounting the roster but really going to town. Yeah. And they, people forget this, see? Yeah. And then Peter, he says, honor the king, yeah. who was Nero. Yeah. <clears throat> Thereafter, Nero had him beheaded. Mm -hmm. But then Nero was going to answer to God, of course. Amen. Say too that uh, refrain from murmuring is itself an act of faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Amen. Believe God in whatever Amen. the circumstances and in things that we could justify complaining about. Amen. That we choose to believe and to pray and seek the Lord. Amen. See, a, a murmurer has suggested that God can't do anything about it, so he's he's asking people to do something. So that's a that's a subtle suggestion. They're murmurers, and they're complainers. Now, I gather that murmuring is more like a frame of mind, and complaining is like focused on something particular. You remember uh, when Israel murmured, but they had a complaint. They said, there, there are giants in the land. And the children of Anak are there. We were like grasshoppers. We thought of ourselves as grasshoppers, and they did too. See, so they focused on a... It's like they were saying, we know God promised us the land, but hey, we didn't know giants. We, we didn't know giants were in there. We know that he said that we inhabit houses we didn't build and have vineyards we didn't plant. Hey, we, we didn't know the land was actually occupied by somebody. Oh, there's some people, some people when the going gets tough, you know, and the winds of fire and trial are upon them, they, 
they talked like they didn't know that this was going to be a difficult way. Even though Jesus said the, the gate's straight, you got to squeeze through it. And the way is narrow. See, but that's a co complainers. They, they complain at things like that. And you remember when Israel came out, a mixed multitude went with them? You remember that? Remember when they, the people complained because they remember the onions, leeks, and garlics? See, Israel didn't eat onions, leeks, and garlics when they were. Everybody understands that, don't they? they didn't, that's not what they were eating. They were out working, trying to gather up straw. They, they, they had provisions taken from them. It's not like this just affects the person that's doing it. We see from this example it affects oh, the yeah. whole. Mm -hmm. But the belt, it says the mixed motive. The people that came out with them, they were the ones that started the complaining. And as you said, it spread through the entire camp of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. A strangers got in there. Hey, we'd like to come out too. Yeah. We haven't been getting a the kind of deal we thought we were going to get in Egypt, and it looks like your favor. Let us come with you. I can't begin to tell you how much trouble I've seen happen because strangers got in the assembly. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Amen. They're spread. Complainers. Are they given? Yes. It said of our Lord that he was as a sheep led to the slaughter, that he led to the shear, but that he opened not. Open not his mouth. Right. Open not his mouth. That was under the worst of all circumstances. I've seen a lot of good. I've seen a lot of examples of good couples uh, where the one was always distracted by the other one, always yeah. pointing out this. Did you see that? Oh, or did yeah. you hear that? Uh -huh. You know, and and, and the other person could never make any headway. Uh -huh. You know that the psalmist he longed for another place where he said. There'll be no complaining in the streets. That's Psalm 144, 14. That sounds good to me. And there'll be no complaining in the streets. So these complaining teachers were obviously not heralding the gospel. Because it's good news. <laughs> they had also failed to associate the living God with whom we have to do with what was going on. They hadn't connected. God with this. See, when you have adverse circumstances, you got to connect it with God and go to God about it. Well, David's one time said, "Well, what if I if I go in there? Will they deliver me up?" Yeah, he said they'll deliver you up. You better not go in there. Another time he said, "Shall I go in?" He said, "You hear a sound of the mulberry trees going." See, every time he faced a potentially dangerous situation, he went to God. He didn't complain. How did I get in this shape? Why did I happen to be here when Goliath came out? How'd that happen when I got here? See, that's what a complainer would have said. These are complainers. This kind of mindset that murmurs and complains must be crucified. There's a little bit of that in all of us, maybe some a lot, that it's easy to murmur and complain, but kill it. Amen. Crucify it and put it to death. These, that's kind of, and for these to be, these to be the teachers, <laughs> that's, that's really bad. And they're walking after their own lusts. Now always, I want to remind you this once again, that these are men that didn't appear to be like this. So those that had befriended them would probably object, <laughs> object to this. But this... These men, they couldn't, if they, if they were known what they were, they couldn't have crept in unaware, see? So they crept in unaware. There they are, right there in the middle of you. Now I got to write, I got to write you because you're sloughing off. You're falling backward. You're not contending for the faith. You got to get up on your feet and contend for the faith. That means fight the good fight of faith. You got to fight to believe. You've learned that, I'm sure. Fight to believe. What happened, if they were really baptized into Christ, <laughs> what happened is they come into the house and when they went to sleep. That's what happened. <coughs> and there is an approach <coughs> to religion, which is a good word. Religion means the outworking of what you, what you believe. There is an approach 
to religion that is conducive to sleep. There's, there's a kind of religion that makes you sleepy. People tend to doze off spiritually. Now they walk after their own lust. Walking, that's a key scriptural term, walking. It's a term that you know, taking one's way, making progress in a certain path. Technically, the word walking means to take one's way, but take oneself, set out, depart, pursue the journey on which one has entered, continue one's journey uh, of preference, to follow one's moral preference. It's, a, it's a, like driving from here to Springfield, or walking from here to Springfield. The walk meant you're on the way. This refers to how a person chooses to live. There's only two destinations now available to men. There's only two destinations, heaven and hell. That's it. That's the only two destinations. There aren't any others. And everybody is in the process of progressing to one or the other. Yeah. Amen. Everybody. Everybody who's ever lived has had to walk on one of these two roads. Everyone who's living right now is walking on one of these two roads. Everyone who's going to live in the world is going to walk on one of these two roads. One is straight, means which means difficult, means you can't go through the gate with a lot of baggage. You've got to kind of strip down. When you come to Christ, at the at the point of entrance, a lot of stuff has got to go. Amen. Yes. Amen. You won't get through the gate. If, I'm telling you, you will not get through the gate if this doesn't happen. Yeah. The gate is narrow. Amen. I don't think this is taught very much. I think right. people are taught, they come to this conclusion that after I get in, then I'll deal with my various different hab habits or whatever. No, they got to go before. Yes. Amen. You say, well, how is a person able to do that without the Lord? You've got to start doing it, and then the Lord will enable you to keep doing it once you get in. But you got to start. Yes. Amen. If you're a drunk, you can't get through that gate with your bottle. Amen. Hmm? You're a drug addict, mm -hmm. druggy. You can't get through the gate with that. Amen. It's got to go. Yes. When you when you enter in, it's got to go. Yeah. Then it's got to go. Yeah. That'll prove whether you really believe or not. Right. See, John the Baptist John the Baptist required this: bring forth fruits meet for repentance. Hey, stop that expression of sin before you come in. Yeah. You can't deal with it at the root. Well, I understand that, but you can deal at the expressive level. Go ahead. Those are the things that you already know are sin. Yes, and sir. after that, you're going to get rid of some more stuff yeah, that you're going right. to discover Amen. later on. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So that's the, 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 the deny yourself. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Christ, Christ expects us not to murmur and complain. He expects his people to love him and to serve him and to be thankful for what he has provided for his people. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. And Amen. There's a lot to be thankful for in there. Yes. Amen. A lot to be thankful for. Amen. Walking, making this progress. Now these false teachers, they were walking, but they was the wrong way. They are walking the wrong way. And listen, whatever road you're on when you leave this world, will determine your eternal destination. Yes, amen. If you're on the broad road, Jesus said it leads to destruction. Yes. But you got to get off that road yes. before you leave this world. Amen. It's a must now. It's a must. Amen. You can't dawdle around about it. If, if you finally you see you're on the wrong road, you got to right then get off that road. And everyone, whatever direction they're going, whether they realize it or not, they're provoking and they're That's promoting right. the way they're going. That's right. Mm. That's right. Walking. So this is the way they lived. 
These were not people just like made some mistakes. It, it, we're not talking about those kind of people. There, there are people who they're misinformed and they make mistakes, but that they're, it's because they've been deceived at some point. But that's not who Jude's talking about. I want to emphasize this. This is not the kind of people he's talking about. Talk about teachers that are deliberately living for self. Yes. Um, before you move on too far, also considering what um, Brother Bob was talking about, not only are you promoting the way in which you're going, but um, one side of you is also being strengthened. Either you're an old man or you're a new man. That's right. That's right. It's being strengthened. That's right. That's right. Yeah, strength of the old man, you got to let him off the cross. In Romans 6, 6, it tells you when you were baptized into Christ, your old man was crucified. God crucified him for God crucified him for you initially. Your commission is keep him on that cross. You let him off, he's just as strong as he ever was. The moment if that thief was let off the cross, he'd always told Jesus, save thyself and us also. If he just saved that thief, he'd come off the cross, he'd went right back to stealing. You'd have been just probably just as shrewd, maybe even some more shrewd. To your, your sinful nature, the old man hasn't lost any of his power. That's why he has to be crucified. See, crucifixion is the mode of death in Scripture. It's a slow death. It's not, it's not like a shot in the head. It's not like that. That's not how the, that's not how the old nature is killed, by shooting in the head. It, it's hung on a cross and it dies. Slow but sure. It dies, and your your role is keep him there. Mortify your members that are up on the earth. And in case you're wondering if this is like as a family trait, they Galatians 5:24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh together with the affections and lusts. That's what the Holy Spirit said. So a person who chooses to walk the broad road and then to teach on top of that. Well, he's, he's walking after his own lusts. And he's using religion to pacify his lusts. We've heard in the last couple of decades, we've heard of big time world famous ministers guilty of gross immorality. That was a revelation. That wasn't like the, at one point in time that you kind of bungled it. That, that, that revealed what they were. Yes. Yeah. You'll notice that nothing like that ever happened to any of the apostles. The biggest, the biggest error you can find of any apostle is Peter not saying anything, but just getting up from one table and going to another table, and that's the only thing you can find against that man. Don't you wish that's all I can find against you? <laughs> huh? These walked out to their own lusts. I think that lust is desire. This is a scripture word for desire, but it's strong. A strong, compelling desire the wrong way. Well, you can have a you can have a right lust. The spirit lusts after you. Holy Spirit wants you. Yeah. Lust is to envy. James says, "Do you think the scripture says spirit scripture say in vain that that's Holy Spirit lusts to envy? The Holy Spirit wants you. Amen. Now, of course, the devil does too." But it's good to think about the Holy Spirit wants me. Yes. It's good to tell yourself this once in a while. The Holy Spirit is lusting after me. He wants me. Yes. He wants me. And the Lord Jesus is saying, come unto me, come unto me, come unto me. <laughs> and the God is saying, look unto me, look unto me, look unto me. See, so you got a lot going for you there. But walking after their own lust, they ignored. See, they ignored all of that. And fed their own lust and lustful desires, their own passions. They weren't living to please God. Paul told the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, to walk and please God. Okay. This is the opposite. Walk after your own lust. That's the exact opposite of that. 
They were not doing the will of God from the heart, these men. They were like the Pharisees. They appear outwardly. They were like sepulchers, whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. They look outwardly very beautiful. But inwardly, they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. See? They were not following God's revealed agenda. They were following his own. But the irony of it, the people to whom Jude wrote didn't see this. They missed this. So you must ask yourself the question. Every person's got to answer this for himself. I, I can only answer for myself. You've got to answer this question. Am I informed enough? Do I know enough about God to recognize a, a wolf when he's dressed up like a sheep? Do I, do I have this kind of alertness? You've got to be honest with yourself now. You can't. But you, then, you, then you take your recourse to God. You ask for grace to help in a time of need. Help me at this because believe me, brethren, in this day of mega media and all that, there's a lot of these type of people that have access to you, not personally, but through the television and literature, the books, and they got access to you. It's good to ask God open my eyes so I can see in advance danger coming or I can see in advance when blessing is coming let's not, let's not stop with just the danger <coughs> there is such a thing as love waxing cold because iniquity abounds the love of many shall wax cold see some people well, the devil promotes this. When I say some people, the devil promotes this. Keep at least a one foot between you and the world. So the person codifies that, makes a little list of what the world does and what you shouldn't do. But then the world, boom, the world <laughs> goes down to a lower level. But what if the person keeps that old list <laughs> of the stuff? Then the church, this is traditionally what just happens. When the world went, yeah. church went down. You, you just say, if you know history, you'll find this is the truth. Right. When the world went down, church went down too. Right. When I say the church, I mean at large. Mm -hmm. The church went down too. The Roman church has been doing that for decades, maybe centuries. Yes. When they went into certain countries and so forth, and just adapt to that culture. That's right. Sprinkle a little Holy Bible and religious right. practice on it. Yeah. Amen. But then the great revivals did the opposite. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's another way for the church to pull the world up. Yeah, but all, all of the great <laughs> revivals never passed to another generation. Yeah. There was never a second generation to any revival. Mm -hmm. Because, oh, there wasn't. No, no, none of them were ever passed to a second generation, not any. And what, what happened was that every generation has to embrace it themselves that, that's the that's the secret and, and so they through temptation they got you people got used to living in a pure environment and they didn't take really take hold of it like the predecessors did so no gender, no revival ever passed to the next generation some really were really short lived like 10 years 20 years yeah. but the reason wasn't that the revival wasn't real it was that the people didn't take hold of what caused the revival, see? Amen. But that is, that is something that occasionally God has done this through history just Amen. to show you that Satan is yeah. not invincible. Amen. But there, there have been whole generations mm -hmm. that have been lost. Yeah. Yeah. That's what happened in the time of the judges. That's right. Mm. They have a revival the dark ages age for, a, for, a, for a millennium, for a millennium, spiritual darkness covered the face of the earth. And there were very few believers. Most of them, where they were, they were on the run. I held a revival meeting for a Mennonite church in Peoria, Illinois. And these were the Mennonite people who were like doctors and lawyers and kind of advanced people. So 
I talked to the minister, I said, uh, I, I don't know that I'm familiar like with what Mennonite people like believe. And I said, do you have it like uh, some basic things that you, because I found we talked, they were, we were not on disagreement on anything. On anything we weren't disagreed. And here's what he told me. He said, well, I'll tell you, Brother Blakely. He says, we were persecuted people. We were on the run, and we didn't have time to develop a, a theology. We had to work on believing. I thought, oh, boy, that's a pretty good answer. Pretty good answer. Well, these false teachers, they're described elsewhere as minding earthly things. Their religion gets down to earth. Eventually, it it bottoms out earthly things and they're looking at things that are seen as compared to things that are not seen. Yeah. Here were teachers that imposed their fleshly mind on the people because the people weren't strong enough. So you can, if people are, are spiritually weak or morally weak, you can impose things on them and cause them to do things they wouldn't normally do. But you can't do that if they're strong spiritually. If they have spiritual strength, you can't, you can't do this. So this is what Satan tries. Satan tries to weaken the fabric of conviction or persuasion or confidence or assurance. He tries to weaken that because when it's weak, you're, you're, you're an easy take. You'll be taken in by the enemy. Church there where Jezebel was. That's right. It caused my servants to commit acts of immorality. And you know that uh, in my background, assurance was not hardly ever mentioned. Grace wasn't talked about very much. Yeah. Because it had, there, because there had been abusive teachings in those areas, yeah. it, we just didn't talk about them at all. They should have promoted them. So consequently, the people are weak, and then so now we've got a generation of young believers that, for for the most part, their understanding of God is appalling. There's exceptions to the rule, but they are exceptions. They're not the rule. When, we, when a person lives in an environment like we do, where there's a lot of error, there will be a tendency to be hypercritical of everything. Oh, yes. But we, you don't have to do that. Do that either, you, no. you can look for the good. You know, I've heard a lot of people, and I may not agree with everything they say, but they'll say something that's really good, and I want to be able to oh, receive no. that. Yeah, we are all blind. Yeah. If what truth is spoken, it doesn't make any difference who said it. If it was a jackass, it doesn't make any difference. You believe it. And you rejoice in the truth, whatever the source it comes from. And sometimes the Lord will bring it from a very unexpected... One of the great prophecies of Scripture was by Balaam. God is not a man that he should lie, and either some of man that he should repent. Had he promised, and shall he not do it? See, <laughs> that's what it is. that was by Balaam. Well, I'm not about to eliminate that, you know. From the... But that's not. But with false prophets, that's not consistent. With with teachers sent by God, that is a consistent practice. Their mouth speaketh great swelling words. <laughs> Some versions read they speak arrogantly or they boast about themselves. Bombastic, I like that word, bombastic words. Pompous, rhetorical, flowery, high sounding. They brag about themselves, the New Living Translation says, loud mouth show offs. Now you'll notice if you can handle it and you, and you listen a little bit to the TV, it's amazing how much these megachurch people talk about themselves. It, it's, it's phenomenal. Me, 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 you know, they think they only have one note, you know, me, me, me. <laughs> That's the exact opposite of how Paul spoke. Paul said he, he did not speak with excellency of speech or wisdom. All right, now we're talking about poetry about the stars and the trees and the bees. I mean, that's beautiful type of language. But when it comes to the things of God, the language isn't what makes the thing so beautiful, it's what it's, it's the message. Amen. Yeah. Amen. See, you really can't 
make the gospel more comely by flowering up yes. the speech or using some pretty words or using some fancy illustrations or humorous anecdotes or this isn't this won't enhance the gospel at all the gospel is enhanced by god and in fact it has a glory that as exceed it keep is still excelling it excels doesn't stop excelling and it's the power of god unto salvation so but these men they they depended on rhetorical presentation and this is uh in some people that i personally know who are i've known for you five or six decades now. They're very gifted writers. One man I'm thinking of in particular, he's changed his writing style to this flowery, flowery type speaking. And uh, I didn't like it when I read it, but it, it's wrong to do that, see? It's wrong to try and make the gospel appealing or to convince people with, with a rhetorical, flowery presentation. No, this this is not right. But these were they, these were people did. But largely, their flowery speech concerned themselves and their ministry. We are now the biggest network in the world. He yeah. one one of the groups say this. Teachers to whom Jude refers were were religious showmen. Their speeches were nothing more than performances. They would have probably sound good to the philosophers at Athens. They probably would have said, well, wasn't that, whoo, wasn't that a flowery speech that he gave there? Paul got up, preached about the resurrection, and they scoffed. See? But when we read, when we read, when a Christian reads what Paul said, they say, oh, what was that some, what was that some sermon? It's because the truth, see, the, the truth was not. All right, let's see this last thing he says about them. They having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Boy, so you see, he's showing no mercy to these, <laughs> to these men. Are these really, really hammering them? It's assumed that many of these men were exposed to Jude's letter. See, these letters were written so that the, the transgressor heard the letter. These were public letters. So you read things like this. There are some among you. <laughs> see, I hear that there are divisions among you. See, the people cause the divisions. They, they were hearing this too. And one time, Paul called out two ladies. He said, are you odious and syndicate? Now be of the same mind in the Lord. Called them right out in the epistle. John called out. Diotrephes, for church at Corinth, that fornicator, is, <laughs> he was a member of the church, they're going to the church, they had to cast him out, but he's there probably when this epistle was read, so, can you imagine, can, I mean, you just kind of have to think about this, but can you imagine a general epistle being read to a whole church, any church, can you imagine that? How good it sound if you were if you were praised because you'd kept the faith and fought a good fight, or what that do for you if you heard that? Or what if you were one of the ones caused a division? You hear this? <laughs> that's how the that's this is how these men wrote. That's right. See, they weren't super sensitive about what transgressors thought about the thing. Amen. Right. You know, if you had been careful like that to not say anything negative, now you said a few things privately to Brother Justin. Yeah. But he told me that he he received it and he grew because yeah. of it. And he said, well, he was so impressed that somebody as busy as you would take time to 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 to, to help him. Now, see, but see, that was taken in with yeah. the good spirit. But see, it could have a person could have yeah. said, well, I won't say it because I might cause trouble. But see, you actually helped him get over some yeah. things that that he couldn't have got over any other way now. And yeah, see that. So you know, this is this got to be done. A leader's got to do this. Oh well, yes, yeah. But every day I have experiences like this, and I, some people bow their back and get angry. You know, and the temptation is 
strike back, which I'd be fully capable of doing, but I don't. You can't. Yep. I think one of the chief ways women fall into is people-pleasing. And that's along the same line. Same as, line, that's uh, right. Uh -huh. Having persons in admiration, whereas you're trying to please a person trying, instead of trying you're, to please God. You're them. exactly right. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a temptation. Satan uses that. <coughs> and particularly, well, Paul called them one place silly women. He didn't mean like stupid women. These are women that were like, like alone. And they were being exploited yeah. because of it, see. So yes, yeah, set. But they're not the only ones. There's men who have this problem. <laughs> men have this problem too, but this, yes, you're right. Remember he said, Paul, uh, Jesus said to one of the churches, you've got some people in your church that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which doctrine I hate. Remember that? He said that to two different churches. you got some people in your church that believe in soul sleeping. Thank you, thank Jesus. you got some people in your church that don't believe you have to be baptized. This is the kind of letters he'd write to churches today. Having people's persons in admiration. Some of the versions say uh, showing respect to persons or flattering people, which is the idea. Flattering. Not, a, uh, not speaking honestly, but trying to get, it, get them on your side with flattering speech. Now this is, uh, unfortunately, the in our century, exploitation in religion has become quite common. Now the first three centuries of the church, this wasn't as much of a problem as it is now. But as soon as the church became popular, but through Constantine, then this kind of this pleasing people thing became kind of, kind of dominant. Shortly after Pentecost, there were such displays of power in the early church that when Ananias and Sapphira were, were struck dead by the Lord, it said that some of the people didn't dare join up with them. <laughs> That's the kind of church that was. No one tried to exploit that church. Ho, ho, ho. They said, oh, don't go there. You know, they got on the billboard, liars fall dead during the service, you know. That's what happens when the church has power. This is what happens. When a church has really Holy Spirit power, it solves a whole bunch of influential problems. But when a church is weak in the aggregate, then it creates a lot of problems. And there's people, exploiters out there standing on the side that couldn't make a go of it in any other field. But they see this opportunity and they exploit the people having people's persons in admiration. admiration. In admiration, that word admiration. The word from which it's translated, it means flattery. Conjolery, that's influency with pleasing words, you know. Breaking the person out, pleasing words. Wheedling, that's a good word. Enticing with soft words. And praising excessively. Now, on the service of God, it's God who's to be praised. Is that not right? God is the one to be praised, but these men praise men. <laughs> now, men are going to be praised all right, by God, faithful men. Amen. Then shall every man have praise from God, 1 Corinthians 4 or 5. So our praise, we don't have to just be bragging about men or one another. And if someone does, we can say, well, I am what I am by the grace of God. If, if in fact, any benefit has come from me, it's not I, but... Christ in me. See, that's we steer away from this type of type of thing because why? Because there's something in the human makeup that this this is a weakness that you've got to over you've got to overcome. People saying something good about you that the 
really, you, you know it's not, you're not that good, but it sounds kind of good to hear it, you know. The world sees them, there are, there are people who don't, who think less of themselves, they have very lowly views of themselves, and the world calls it low self-esteem. But actually, these people, there are people who have this, but these people don't delight, they really want self, they really want esteem, but they just, they kind of been beat down by life, and they'd like someone to talk nice to them, so see, there are there's these false teachers. You see, this is a widow lady. She's got a, she's pretty wealthy. So they appeal, see? They weaken this person by appealing to them with pleasing speech and good words. I imagine this is how some of the Pharisees robbed widows' houses. Yeah. Remember, they yes. robbed widows' robbed widows' houses. Probably talked them out of it. I mean, people like this talk of talk people out of their estates. Oh, yeah. Talk them out of their estates mm -hmm. because of advantage. See, they're doing it. They're soft talking, pleasing talking, pleasing the people. Is it because they really respect the people or want to encourage the people? It's, they want to weaken the people so the people will serve their own purposes. Peter says of these men, these say, Peter talked about these same things parallel with Jude. Peter says of this, through covetousness shall they make feigned, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. See, so they, he's saying the same thing. They're buying you for themselves. Yes. It seems to me that this is like a false, a false pi picture of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the world's way of saying, "I love you." See, I won't harm you. Yeah. I, I think so highly of you. I don't even know what you're capable of, really. I like you so well, and and a person makes themselves vulnerable to this, mm -hmm. and is puffed up by it, takes it in, mm -hmm. and and as soon as the gates are open. Satan can slip in and take what he wants. Amen. And people do that to each other. I've, I've given this advice to young ladies, particularly in our time. Not to, not to present yourself as like a simple, naive person. If you have a pure life, don't like hang a sign on yourself saying, I'm a virgin. Say, why not? Because there are men that will conquer you. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. yeah. that's Don't brag about your virtue. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Because there are people that sweet talk you. Mm -hmm. And there's been, there been a lot in recent years right here in town. There's been some ministers that sweet talked women and right. committed right. adultery with them. Yeah. yeah. That's what. That's an example of this right here, and, there, and this, unfortunately, there's a lot of this in the religious world. Yeah. One of my uh, past friends goes back fifty some years, fifty fifty eight years. Paul Benjamin is his name. He still has his ministry. It's called a safety net ministry. It's exclusively for Christian church ministers. And a safety net ministry rescues men, preachers, that have fallen into immorality. The last time I saw Brother Benjamin, Paul Benjamin, he said, Brother Gavin, we can't keep up with this problem. There are so many cases. I've got 11 men on staff now, and we, there is so much of this happening, we cannot keep up with it. That's an example of what we're talking about here. That way, it started to aid. That's right. Ministers who were mistreated by the congregation. That's right. I remember when that started. Yeah. That's the way it started, but it yeah. ended up. It ended up. Yeah. yeah. And this, uh, this was discussed. When I'm at a, at a uh, unity forum we had here in Joplin, matter of fact. And this question came up because it's, it's a, this is a, a large problem. Ministers falling into immorality. And so they, they've they talked it all out and said that they felt that we needed to have some special training on this. And so I, I couldn't take any more of it. I was very agitated. So I said, now we, we're whole, close to Oklahoma here. They have a lot of horse ranches in Oklahoma. 
And I said, you can imagine if this horse rancher, he's losing a lot of horses. And so he hires horse catchers to go out and get these horses. I said, now I personally think he ought to find out where they're getting out and patch the fence. But you can't make a career out of that seat. That, that's, that's the catch there. <laughs> because of advantage. These men have exploited people because they bought into this concept, which is stated in Scripture. They supposed that gain was godliness. They, they supposed that gain was godliness. What does the Lord say about people who suppose there are, now this is taught, everybody knows this, I trust. God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. There's going to be a big exchange of the wealth, transfer of the wealth of the world to the Christian people. You should not have to drive an old car. This stuff is said now. <clears throat> Here's what Paul said about, was it the bought into this supposed gain is godliness. He says, these are men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Well, Paul, what are we going to do about people like that? From such, withdraw thyself. Get away from those people. Yeah. Don't become one of their victims. They're destitute. Now, think of this truth, this statement. Destitute of truth. Having no truth, being destitute. That means God will not allow these people to see the truth. Yeah, amen. He'll pour out the spirit of deep sleep. So I tell you, this God does not play around with this kind of condition. Isaiah 29 10 tells you he did this to all Israel. He said, they wouldn't listen to me. They wouldn't listen to me. I sent them my prophets. I sent them early. I sent early. sent my prophets early. They didn't listen. I said, now I'll pour out the spirit of deep sleep. And I'm going to blind them. Jesus said, his disciples said, why do you teach the multitudes in parables? Would you explain them to us? Well, he said, it's given to you to understand. It's not given to them. So I say it in parables, so lest they hear and believe and repent, and I forgive their sins. That's he didn't want to do. He didn't want to do that for these people. Right. Now you go and read it for yourself. That's what he said. Yeah. Matthew 13. That's yeah. these people were in that category, yes. and yet they had come in unawares. Yes. You see the seriousness of the situation. How serious this was. And these people to whom Jude wrote, they didn't even know this had happened. Yeah. They all say, what should we do about that? <laughs> now, everything, everything a believer or a group of believers needs to be safe has been supplied in Christ. Amen. We're complete in Christ. Everything we need to stop this from happening is there. Recovering from it, now see, that's, that's, another, that's a challenge. It's possible, but it takes a lot of work. Yeah. Recovery is harder than conversion. Yeah. Believe me, I tell you. Yeah. It's harder to turn a backslidden Christian than it is to convert a worse sinner in the world. Yeah. And a person who does try and recover people has to approach it with great care. Yeah, first of all, it has to be a spiritual person. You gotta, everybody shouldn't do this. You that are spiritual, restore such a one. Do it in the spirit of meekness, lest you're tempted yourself. Yes. Jude said, do it, snatch them, with, save them with fear, not, not scare them into heaven. That's not what he said. You do it. You approach this with fear, because hate even the garment spotted by the flesh. Because this is a dangerous situation. Amen. You'll be contaminated. Yes. So the, the solution to the dilemma is, Build yourself up with the most holy faith. Let all things be done to edification. Get the church grown up into Christ and all things so that these kind of people do not feel Amen. comfortable in the assembly. Amen. They feel ill at ease. 
in these kind of, teachers, we're talking about teachers, these kind of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I think I closed there, but it's, it's a uh, sober thing to think about. I, I lay awake at night and think about, I think about these things. I say, I, I don't want to just be someone who's talking against false prophets all the time. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be silent about them either. That's right. Amen. Yeah. So you've got the, your pre, the predominant message has to be the gospel. That has to be the predominant message. And you have, the aim is to stabilize the people of God. Stay, they can withstand anything if they're stable. They can stand under any gale if they're stable. If they're not stable, they can't stand up under anything. Amen. It's to stabilize the people of God. And in the stability, there's like a, your, your senses, spiritual senses are, are honed up to the sharpest. So you're able to detect dangerous influences. You don't, you don't want to surmise about dangerous influences or guess. <laughs> don't do that. You gotta, is this something you got to know? And you can only do that if you're, if you're sharp in your spirit. Your senses are exercised to discern good and evil. See, because false, false prophets and sinners give themselves away early on. If you're alert enough, you can pick, you can pick up on it. They'll give themselves away. Same thing as real believers give themselves away. First thing you pick up, hey, this is this is what this is a brother or sister. You pick up on it right away. But your senses have to be exercised. See, to sense it. And if you ever, yes. You know, there's a tendency in um, in people that are following Christ to over, over uh, that they think they're stronger than they really are. Especially, yeah, especially in new believers, that they, they, they know something about the scriptures, they know they're, they're, they know they love God, and, and yet they think they're ready to go out and fight the battles. But yeah. but this is not this is like you said, this is somebody who is already mature. Already walking by faith and already able to stand because I can t tell you, I can testify. I, there was a time years ago when I thought I was strong, but when I met up with some, some people that had fallen away and they tried to convince me, and, and even though they didn't convince me at the time, all those reasonings went with me. And I had to fight against those things, and they, it was very difficult. It was because I over, I thought I was stronger than I really was. And that's a dangerous thing, especially when you're young and you go out, you, you, you think, I can, I can do this. Well, I never could do it to begin with. It wasn't me. But I thought, I thought I was, yeah. I, I could do it. But yeah. I, I couldn't. Now, Christ in you can do a lot of things, but it's, it's not the same as you going out saying, I'm going to win the world. <laughs> Now, I, I advise this, that a young Christian should never try and correct somebody. Why? Because you, you're, just, you're just not able. And, and whether this is an assembly or whatever, a person who's not grounded shouldn't major on, like, correction and exposure. And, because there's someone on the opposing side that's smarter. That if you're not stable, just pick you to pieces. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Maybe sometime in your young life you were embarrassed by somebody who did this. Just make a fool of you in front of everybody. So just uh, young believers, just testify what you've experienced in Christ. Yes. Testify what you know about Christ. Testify what's drawn you to Christ. Then as you grow, then you'll, you'll be able to do these other, other matters without any jeopardy. Seems simple to say, but false teachers are takers and true teachers are givers. Amen. And they yes, both good. represent a superior spirit that is animating them. Mm -hmm. See, God is abundant yeah. in goodness and truth, and yeah. so that flows through his teachers. But the devil has come to steal yes, yeah, right. and kill and destroy. Yes, and so, but see, that shows how cunning and deceptive the devil is. That he can take from you and you don't even know it. Yeah. That's what had happened to these brothers. They were being taken from and they didn't even realize it. They're losing strength. They're losing perception. They're losing all of these kind of things. These sensitivity and those kind of things. And they're not even realizing it. A little bit. That's right. Mm.
Well said. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, it's in. Um, something that I have learned in part of my training is to be able to tell the difference between a real, you know, dollar bill or a fake. And one of the um, key things is that the face on um, the real bill, it looks alive. It has, looks like it has real life, but the fake doesn't. It doesn't look real. Mm -hmm. And um, considering a false teacher and a true teacher is you can see the life. And teacher sent from the Lord, but you can't see this life in a false teacher. Yeah. And that's one way to tell the difference between the two. Amen. Yes, we, we know that sin promotes sin when we look at unbelievers and unbelievers, but it's good also to be cautious to know that sin provokes sin. And so I, I love how Jude, he's not complaining against the complainer. Yes, right. He's not sinfully yeah. boasting against the boastful. But he shines forth the light of Christ and he holds forth the word of life. And that's that light you're speaking of that it it judges the darkness. Yeah. It cuts mm -hmm. right to the heart yeah. while the person who is confronting it remains blameless and unstained. Mm -hmm by that and to have the discernment as to how to do that when you assess how you're to respond always look for the blameless way Amen. yeah yeah yes who's going to end that i really high yeah. note yeah. yeah and you blameless notice when, when, when jesus confronted the churches of asia there were five of them that were four of them were really bad five of them but he ended on a high note. That's right. He held out a promise to them. See, this is this is a, the true person of God. They have some sharp, studying rebukes. Yeah. But they end yes. on a high note. Amen. On a high note for the appeal. See, so that's a, that's one of the difference between the false right. and the true. The false is end on a downer. Uh -huh. yeah. mm. That's right. That you check out those letters to the church. Uh -huh. Every one of them, every one of them gave them a, gave them a wonderful promise. Even uh -huh. the church at Laodicea yeah. gave them one of the best promises. Yeah. Uh -huh. They were ready to spit them out. Left the promise. Yeah. Amen. Good. Yeah, David in the Psalms does that too. That's right. Yes. That's right. He always ends on the positive. Yeah. That's because the the purpose of rebuke. And exposure is actually to, to, a, turn, to yeah. turn the person. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, some of you won't be turned, but that still has to be a gift. And Jesus said, How oft yes. yeah. would I have been? A, who knows how much that was? Uh -huh. How oft would I have been? There must have been particular times uh -huh. all through Christ's ministry that he was particularly tender. He could have given them all to get yeah. right there, yeah. right there, but you would not. Mm. Yes, it's a little bit. Yeah, I like this point. I just, I just love how he made out of having men persons in admiration to refrain from that. Because then, even when he's crafty in that, he'll think, he'll make you think, well, if you could just please your boss or so and so. Then the Lord will have approval of you because He, everyone else around you is pleased. Mm -hmm. But you'll find that if you put Christ as the head, main key in that, you actually find satisfaction in that. Yeah. And you're not left in a spiral, of, you know, what's going on. That's right. But you find satisfaction in yes. having Christ as your first, Amen. foremost. Yes. You remember that Paul he told, told the servants to please their masters and he said, now if they're a believer, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. extended yeah. himself there, there yeah. the yeah. But the reason they pleased him was because uh -huh. the master had a master too. Yeah. Amen. Right? Amen. Yeah. So they, by pleasing him, they left it with the, left it with the Lord. Yeah. Amen. But I like that. Where he said, they're a believer now. Really. Yeah. They're partaker of the benefits. So really, yeah. really extend yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, you got the word now. <laughs> Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the faithfulness of Brother Jude, for his perspective. 
we ask, Lord, we want to be part of the <clears throat> solution to some of these things. Wherever we find a time to speak an appropriate word, alert people, hold out a promise to them, warn them, we ask for grace to do it according to our measure of faith. We pray in the meantime that you'd raise up faithful men and women of God all across the world who, like the children of Issachar, know the times, what the people should do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>